the, the one of the differentiating factors for circuit board medics versus a lot of other remanufacturers in the electronics industry is we just move lightning fast. I mean, developing the repairs, you know, 99% of what we have listed on our website as well, on a repair and return basis, we guarantee a one business day turnaround. If you've been in the trucking industry for any length of time, you have seen a tremendous amount of change in the uh, commercial equipment that we use every day. I think back to when I first started in the industry and everything was mechanical and pneumatics, and now it is uh, a very different world. With new technology brings uh, better performance sometimes, but it also can bring additional challenges. And sometimes we just need to get hooked up with the right person to be able to solve a problem and to be able to get the most out of the parts that we're buying. So today we're going to talk about circuit boards and we're going to talk about their role in commercial trucking. In order to uh, have that conversation, I've invited Ed Edwards, the president of Circuit Board Medics on the podcast. Now, Ed is passionate about building teams. He really is passionate about remanufacturing parts to quality and to making them, you know, better than new. So we want to meet or exceed that OEM specification. That's the, to me, that's the hallmark of a true remanufacturer, not just someone out there trying to rebuild stuff. And Ed has cultivated a problem-solving environment at Circuit Board Medics, where team members believe that everything is (laughs) figureoutable. Now, that probably sounds funny coming from a Canadian. Ed, welcome to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. So glad to have you here. Yeah, it's good to be here, Jamie. Um, And I'm not sure if you can even see that small sign behind my desk, but that's what our team, I say that so often, everything is figureoutable. That's one of the gifts that our team uh, got for me and put it on the desk behind me. Um, It's just a phrase we've coined around here, but it's good to be here. It it says a lot about your perspective on things and that you're really focused on solutions and, and solving problems. So let's talk a little bit about the trends that we're seeing How have supply chain shortages, you know, that's been a top of mind of everybody for a couple of years now. So how have supply chain shortages of electronic components impacted the trucking industry? Yeah. And everyone's tired of hearing the the phrase supply chain, especially supply chain shortage. The supply chain shortage has, uh, from our unique perspective, has really opened the door to a lot of the ESG, the environmental sustainability and, and governance policies that we're starting to see is pushing us in a world that has uh, typically been anti-remanufacturing, starting to push a lot of people towards embracing remanufacturing because, uh, quite frankly, in the last year or two, there are a lot of products, especially in the electronics world, that are only available through remanufacturing. We've had customers over the last decade that have been very anti-reman because everyone's got a story around how they've been burned by remanufactured products. You know, in every industry, there are good guys, there are bad guys. In the remanufacturing world, it feels like there's a lot more bad guys than good guys. And and what we're seeing is that in the trucking industry, that supply chain shortage um, has really, really put a cramp on things. Um, you know, like the CPCs for Freightliner, like the MX13 ECMs, um, things that anyone in the heavy duty trucking industry would um, kind of roll their eyes or shake their head at. They they know how uh, difficult these these items are to find. Ed, you you might not know this, but I started my career in remanufacturing the first 10 years and we were remanufacturing pneumatics and and air over hydraulic components and things of that nature. But you're right, even 25 years ago, there there were people who loved reman and there was a lot of people that just said, no, I don't don't want that rebuilt crap. But um, the reality is, is that there's such a big difference between someone who's you know, cleaning up a part and reselling it and someone who's actually going through a remanufacturing process. In fact, one of the benefits, if you are a true blue remanufacturer, is you get to see what happens with the OEM products and where they fail. So speaking of that, why are there high failure rates with OEM circuit boards? Like what's going on there? Yeah, you know, we live in a a very fast evolving, fast paced world um, that's embracing technology at at the speed of light. And, you know, it's it's not I applaud the OEs for adopting technology. And there's so much safety built in the new vehicles these days that did not exist a decade ago. 
But to be on the cutting edge of technology, you're going to have to take risk. You're going to have to try things that can't be proven. Um, if you spend too much time in a test bed environment proving things out, then they're obsolete by the time you release them to market. So, you know, the benefit we have, you just nailed it, Jamie, is that we get to see the product after it has hundreds of thousands of miles on it. We get to see what actually didn't go as planned. Um, something that worked great on paper, but in the real world, there were factors, there were variables that just could not be considered, could not be forecasted, could not be predicted. And the effect and toll that that takes, especially on the electronics. So we get to collect that data. We get to see all the failures and then truly make that better than new. It's not that I'm saying that we have, you know, bigger resources than an OE and that we can create it better than you. We just have the benefit of having all of that extra information. We have the benefit of it coming in and us seeing what the failure mode was so that we can then take the weakest link of the chain, make it stronger to take the the entire chain, make the entire chain stronger. And just figure it out. Um, you know, what when it comes to what you just said about the the OEs and and how they, there's a lot of pressure on them. You know, I don't think people realize that a lot of these government mandates, a lot of the uh, regulations, especially in commercial, it's so heavily regulated. You know, they, they come down and just say to the truck manufacturers, okay, you have to meet this spec. And the truck manufacturers are left to figure it out. So there is room there for, for error. There's room for, and like you said, it's also about that kind of like cost benefit analysis. It's like, how far do we go? And if we can get it to work, is that going to be good enough? And, you know, they're not, I don't see them purposely trying to build in uh, obsolescence or, or premature failure that, that doesn't make for happy customers who want to drive their badge. So they're very focused on trying to make it work, but. Reality is reality. So when it comes time for you to take a look at a circuit board and say, okay, it's time to remanufacture this and to, to what we've already discussed, you've had the benefit of being able to, to look at all of those failures and say, okay, where's the weakest link? Like what, what challenges do you run into when trying to remanufacture a circuit board? Oh, the challenges that we have is biggest challenge is that we don't have the original schematics. We don't have the original data. We don't have. Um, a lot of the design information around the circuit board. So, you know, I hate the term reverse engineering because it kind of has a connotation of, you know, a, a Chinese knockoff product of something. But that is truly what we have to do is go in and reverse engineer the circuit board to figure out why is it doing what it's doing? How is it doing what it's doing? You know, just mapping that control board out um, and understanding uh, more about it so that we can find the failures and can predict even future failures. When we remanufacture something, we're not only looking at the failure that disabled the circuit board currently, um, we're trying to get a broader understanding and predict what's going to cause this to fail in the next three or five or 10 years and what can we upgrade while we're in there rebuilding it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know when, when I was working in remanufacturing, we also ran into the issue of certain things were proprietary to manufacturers and we had to come up with new designs that were different enough to, to get around that. When you're remanufacturing, do you run into anything in that nature? For what we uh, typically remanufacture, we're not changing anything that's proprietary about the circuit board. There are a lot of proprietary parts on the circuit board. There's proprietary means of it performing certain functions um, that just make it a little bit harder to figure out. That kind of gets back to the, you know, everything is figure outable uh, you know, phrase that we started with. But what we also see in the automotive world, now we service other industries outside of automotive, but one unique thing about the automotive industry is there is a lot of collaboration. There is a lot of focus on the customer. Uh, we've had OEs come to us and just kind of open up their design books to say, hey, we, we have these problems. We, we do want your help. We want your unique perspective and, and point of view on this. Um, so there is a lot more collaboration from that standpoint. But for the most part, you know, as far as dealing with anything proprietary, uh, it's, it's harder to figure out. And that usually puts us in a position uh, where it surfaces in a test environment. It's harder to build a test environment for things. Um, we have can. CAN bus networks on vehicles these days that require many different modules to communicate with each other in order for the module to function properly. There's a lot of anti-theft built into modules where they have to have communication with other modules. Um, all those things uh, to build a test environment that does fully test that module um, that we're working on, is, is, is it definitely creates challenges. 
Well, that makes a lot of sense. I'm looking forward to learning more and uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit more about what Circuit Board Medics is doing for the trucking industry. We'll be right back. Don't have a heavy duty part number and need to look up a part? Go to parts.diesellaptops.com or download the app on Apple or Android to create your free account. Looking for high quality fuel injection for heavy duty applications? Having one supplier for fuel injection allows you to better serve customers by providing them with a complete line which increases your sales and profitability. Learn more at ambacinternational.com slash aftermarket. Parts availability and quality have a big influence on fleets and owner operators total cost of operation. If they can't find a part, it means more downtime. If they install a low quality part and it fails, it means even more costs like tow bills, hotels, meals for the driver, and lost revenue. That's why we recommend Sampa. They manufacture a wide range of advanced parts for commercial vehicles. Their website has an intelligent product search engine and broad coverage of suspension, steering, and fifth wheel components. Expect more. Expect Sampa. Visit Sampa.com today. We're back from our break. And uh, before the break, Ed, you're doing a great job of kind of giving us a an overview of where we're at with uh, circuit boards in the commercial trucking industry. Uh, let's talk a little more specifically about your service. So when I was remanufacturing, we were able to build up a large uh, core bank and we were able to remanufacture products ahead of time, put them on the shelf and then ship stock orders to our distributors. And then they sold them. Once they sold them, they got the core back, they sent it to us and the you know process repeated all over again. What's it like remanufacturing circuit boards? Is it that environment or is it something different? Yeah, we have a mixed environment. So we consider those two different value streams. From a, from a lean manufacturing point of view, we have a repair and return value stream um, where you send us the product, we remanufacture it, send it back to you. And then we also have the exchange or remanufactured value stream as well, where we have exactly what you just described, the product on the shelf, we ship it and it's, we get the core in return. There are challenges with both. We had a perfect world. We would choose to do the fully upfront remanufactured exchange option for everything. Um, that obviously serves the customer the best. Uh, the products that we have in our finished goods inventory that are ready to ship, all orders placed by 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ship same day. So that is definitely honoring the customer's best interest. There are situations, though, that involve programming. Uh, one of our goals is that when a customer gets a product from us, they, they don't have to deal with programming. You know, a lot of customers, a lot of End users do not have the means to program the device. In the world of instrument clusters, um, even some of those have to be ordered from the OE pre-programmed because of mileage programming, engine hours, those type features on the cluster. So if there are some programming restrictions that keep us from doing that on the bench, that's usually when we offer a repair and return service. Or even going back to the mixed model, a new product for us is typically always a repair and return. In the case of the CPC modules, finding those was next to impossible, finding core for those. So we offered a repair service and we slowly along the way were able to purchase core um, until we could have enough core to offer the exchange service. So we actually have a mixed model for those. There are a lot of aftermarket programs with CPCs. I mean, I'm just using the CPC as an example, but there are a lot of aftermarket programs that the uh, driver wants to maintain and not lose. Uh, he would lose it with an exchange module. He'd get stock programming. So they're sending those in for repair so we can serve their, their needs best. It's funny. I haven't heard the expression repair and return for many years. I, I used to be in charge of the repair and return department at the remanufacturing plant that I worked at. So I'm very familiar with that process. People want their stuff back and they, they want it back uh, ready to go. So. Describe for me who your ideal customer is, because I mean, depending on how old the vehicle is, depending on whether it's a fleet or a repair shop, there's got to be kind of a sweet spot for who you're looking to do business with. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, we do, we are very unique in the, from the standpoint that we service just about everyone in the supply chain. So we have do-it-yourselfers that go to circuitboardmedics.com and place an order for just one product. We serve them with one repair and that is it. They'll never need us again. They, you know, we have all the way from there to, uh, you know, bulk remanufacturers, uh, like turbo remanufacturers that are sending the actuator, the VGT actuators to us to remanufacture as they remanufacture the turbo, all the way to the OEs. We do have, you know, some work that we remanufacture for the OEs as well. 
So when you talk about an ideal customer, really, it's not a persona of where they are in the supply chain, you know, because obviously every different area of the supply chain has different target margins and things like that. That's not really what I think of when I think of ideal customers. For me, an ideal customer is someone that is going to partner with us and just share information openly. A great example of that is um, we partnered with a trucking fleet um, when the CPCs were brought to our attention, which was last year around this time at HDAW in Dallas. Um, That's when the CPCs were were brought to our attention at that trade show. Um, We started doing some industry research, realized just what an industry-wide problem it was. But we knew we were going to need help to develop that at a lightning fast pace. We move very quickly. We are, you know, big enough to have great capabilities, small enough to be agile and, and move quickly. And um, we were able to partner with a fleet that we'd never done business with before, a national fleet that had 85 trucks down just due to CPCs. And they were instrumental in us getting to market first with the CPCs. They allowed us to use their trucks for testing. They allowed us to destroy several CPCs just from a exploratory surgery type point of view, you know, but we have x-ray machines here. We can x-ray things and we can do all kinds of, we can use technology to accomplish a lot, but there's a certain amount of destructive testing that needs to happen to truly map out and develop a a circuit board. So, you know, we kind of, we just really partnered with them. We shared information very openly. At one point, we even threw out a price to these guys that we thought we were going to be able to hit. And they came back and said, I think your price is too low on them. I mean, then we have wow. a customer that tells us that, right? <laughs> um, you know, that's, and that's, that's just the ideal. We're honoring their best interest. We are, you know, in it for them. They're honoring our best interest. They're in it for us. Um, and that is really what the ideal customer to us looks like. I mean, that is a name that we continue to use around here often. They helped us develop the testing. Uh, obviously, I've mentioned that we were able to use their trucks, but they also helped us, you know, by using those trucks, develop bench testing um, because it's just not feasible to throw every unit on a truck and drive it. And then it's since then, over the, you know, during 2022, they were also bringing us more products, more of the, uh, of, of the problems that the industry is plagued with. So someone that's going to be in it with the long haul with us like that is, is very, very helpful. Yeah. And that is so true. You know, you know, you're solving a real problem when your customer cares about your profitability because they want you around for a long time so that you can keep helping them. That speaks to economic impact. So you look at a fleet with 85 trucks down from just one circuit board issue at the CPC. What kind of economic impact is that having on a company? Like that's a significant dollar amount. Yeah. I mean, it's the downtime. I mean, like we the, the one of the differentiating factors for circuit board medics versus a lot of other remanufacturers in the electronics industry is we just move lightning fast. I mean, developing the repairs, you know, 99% of what we have listed on our website as well, it, on a repair and return basis, we guarantee a one business day turnaround. That's just, that's been in our DNA since day one, because I hate downtime as much as the customer hates downtime. It's not fair for things to sit. Um, I hate idle time. I don't, I hate non-productive time. And everyone here on our team kind of shares that same sentiment. So, you know, if, if we can perform a repair in five or six hours, then why would we allow it to sit on our shelf for four days before we got to it? Right. And we certainly wouldn't allow it to sit on our shelf for four days after it was repaired before it shipped. So just incorporating that lean manufacturing, things have to be moving. Things have to be value added. Things have to. Um, you know, be anti forms of waste. That is that has really infiltrated our custom our our culture because the economic impact is the downtime. I mean, people depend on on these things to work and to work well. So a colleague of mine, he went to school, he became an engineer, decided that he wanted to go back to school and became a psychologist. So what does a psychologist with an engineer background build? He builds a per- personality profile assessment tool, right? It's funny how people arrive where they are at. And and oftentimes it's the cross section of several things that kind of gets them to where they're at. I think of me going, you know, starting out in heavy duty parts and remanufacturing and then getting into distribution and then leaving the industry and building my service company and doing a whole you know, startup to M&A experience and then coming back in the industry and getting in media. A lot of things had to happen to get me to this point. What was the cross-section of education, experience, and background for you that got you to this point with with this company? I'm fascinated to, to know that. 
But Jamie, it's, it's very funny that you mentioned the personality profile. Uh, we use a, a personality profile software as well that has been instrumental in the way that we hire and the way that we develop people. Um, you know, you can't teach a fish to climb a tree, right? You'll think that the fish, that's not his native genius. So we tap into people's native genius here. We identify gaps in teams of what we need in our next three or four hires for those teams. Like, what are the gaps? Um, you know, we help balance each other out. If everyone has a sense of urgency and everyone's hair's on fire, probably not a good analogy to say hair on fire with me, but <laughs> then then it's not a fun place to work, right? You have to balance that um, before you just create a bunch of unnecessary chaos. So the, I'm a big fan of, of the personality profile and, and the self-awareness that we get with that and the way that we can build teams. What it was for me is I am the kind of person that, um, you know, a good vacation for me is adventurous. I want to be moving the whole time. I don't want to sit on a beach and just read a book. I have a hard time kind of slowing down and, and resting. And I think that has been built into, I, I don't have a hard time with recreation. I love doing the fun things, right? It's just the, the slow down and, and the rest. And that is what, um, you know, there's some good parts of that. There's also some bad parts of that. Without letting that get too corrupted, that's the part for me that just wants to keep driving and minimizing the downtime for customers, keeping things moving, um, keeping projects moving internally, just always thinking, what's the next step? I mean, we're just a few days into 2023 right now, and already I'm thinking 2024. Um, like, where do we go? What are we, what are we doing next? So from one person with high pace to another, I totally understand where you're coming from. What was it that drew you to like the circuit boards and remanufacturing and our industry? That's more what I was asking. Yeah. Quite honestly, what that was is I was my own first customer. I worked uh, in uh, manufacturing uh, for Parker Hannafin, a uh, fantastic company to work with. My background was in mechanical engineering. I was like, once again, in manufacturing engineering with them. Um, and I just realized I had this knack that I was always helping the maintenance team out with electronics failure. If it was a circuit board, if it was an ACDC drive on a machine, but out on the production lines, I always was, I, I was drawn to the to electronics failures and just had a knack for kind of helping troubleshoot that. You fast forward till I had two small children at home. And um, when you have two small children uh, under the age of three, you do a lot of laundry. And we <laughs> yes. had a uh, washing machine that failed. And the replacement control board for it, which was the failure, was $400. And I mean, this is 15 years ago. We're looking at a $400 circuit board for a $500 washing machine. I knew that that, that just wasn't right. We're also looking at a washing machine that was less than two years old. So there was some of that kind of better than new responsibility I felt of, you know, our grandparents didn't buy appliances that lasted two years and then had a service call on them, right? We still have the refrigerators in our garages that kind of outlast us, you know, from, from earlier years, right? So I did fix the control board myself, realized that there was probably other people that were um, having the same failure. I just didn't know how to find them. So I put a service on eBay. That in itself kind of exploded into my garage starting to transform into somewhat of a laboratory for testing. I was buying oscilloscopes and everything I could to continue troubleshooting more and more and more of these circuit boards because the failures weren't always the same. About that time, I had a Power Stroke 6.0 and you probably know where this is going, but we had a fuel injection control module failure, the FICM, right? Um, so I would claim to have been the uh, very first repair service for FICMs on eBay, which is flooded with that right now. But that was about 13 or 14 years ago at this point. And um, started repairing FICMs, and that's where I really saw, and that's kind of the roots of Circuit Board Medics. Is we have a, we're very heavily involved in the appliance industry, very heavily involved in the automotive industry, and they both came from there. But where the crossroads really came is not that they were, that was our first two products that grew out of my garage. Crossroads really came to be that those are industries where people um, don't go through a, a long decision making process of, am I going to repair this? When your car breaks, you know you have to fix it. You're just looking for the best option to fix it. When your refrigerator fails, when your washing machine fails, people don't go through this long decision-making process like they would if it's a mountain bike that's been hanging in their garage for three years and only been used twice in those three years. You know, it's items that we depend on daily. That's really where that speed of service and that turnaround time was a great anchor point as Circuit Board Medics began to form 
of, hey, we're going to do a one day turnaround. Part of that, once again, was getting back to that lean mentality of I just don't want to get I get overwhelmed and stressed out by a backlog. Like I don't want the backlog. So how do we prevent a backlog? We jump on it as soon as we get it. We get it repaired. We get it right back to the customer. And those are, are the appliance world, automotive world are are two things that we need done quickly. I'm just going to go out on a limb here and guess that there's probably not big stacks of paper on your desk or a lot of uh, unanswered emails in your inbox, correct? There, There's more than I'm comfortable with, right? Okay, but um, it makes you uncomfortable when that number does. gets too high? It does. It does. <laughs> Man, that pace characteristic just dominates uh, uh, people's lives when when it's uh, as high as it is for, for people like you and I. I think that's that's funny. Well, thank you so much for taking the time for coming on the show and just sharing that story. I think it's important for people to understand the origins of your company. Now, you've been listening to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. I'm your host, Jamie Irvin, and we've been speaking with Ed Edwards, the president of Circuit Board Medics. To learn more about Circuit Board Medics, go to circuitboardmedics.com. The URL and the link will be in the show notes. Ed, thanks for being on the Heavy Duty Parts Report. I look forward to having you on the show in the future. Yeah, it's great to be here, Jamie. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you for watching this video. Click here to subscribe to the Heavy Duty Parts Report YouTube channel and click here to watch another great episode.